Hello and welcome to the last episode of Fridays on the Farm. This series is a collaboration between the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, UMN Extension, the Minnesota NRCS, and Renville and Redwood Soil and Water Conservation Districts. My name is Kelly and I'm the Coalition Assistant with the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. And today we'll be in the field with Jennifer Hahn, the Coalition Coordinator with Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, Holly Hadowick, District Manager of the Renville County SWCD, and Kristen Brennan, a state soil health specialist with the NRCS. We'll be talking with Matt Tiffany, farmer in Southwest Minnesota, and he's also a farmer mentor for the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. The coalition is a producer-driven, producer-led soil health organization, and we're offering information, support, and networking to Minnesota farmers. Today, we'll be talking to Matt about soil health on his farm. He and his, uh, he and Bruce Tiffany raise corn and soybeans using a no-till and strip-till uh, method and they utilize cover crops. They found savings with reduced inputs while maintaining yields and improving their soils. They also won the Carbon Cup Challenge, having the highest organic matter in the entire state. If you've got any questions during the session, please type them into the Facebook live stream and our hosts will be happy to discuss them with um, Kristen and Matt once we get to that portion of the session. All right, it looks like they are already down in the field, so let's get tuned in. But uh, through changes with, with Del Monte and stuff, that's not, not an option anymore. But, uh, you know, just kind of got into the covers and stuff through the canning crops, having a window to get covers seeded. Uh, back in about 2014 was uh, kind of when we first started stuff. Okay, so about how many acres do you farm? Uh, between my dad and I were somewhere right around that 2200. Okay. Um, so not huge, not small, kind of in the middle. Enough for us. <laughs> yeah, and your rotation again, you kind of have a, you do a bunch of different things here. We do a lot of different things. Um, this was the first year with the cereal rye and what we're, what we're trying to do is use that as a tool to rotate. So we'd go corn, soybeans, cereal rye, soybeans, corn, <clears throat> and kind of offset one of those corn years. Um, obviously, economically, it's right now, that looks like a, an all right deal for us. Uh, the soil health reasons, but then spreading our workload. Yeah. When we look at, we can harvest, if it's just the two of us and my grandpa who's 92 and helps us quite a bit, <laughs> but he's 92. Um, if we can get some work done in July, gives us a window to get some tiling done. We have a nice cover growing. It allows us to get more of our work done. We're now all backed up harvesting a couple hundred more acres of corn in the fall. So. Using that, but it's predominantly corn soybeans. Our soybeans are really unique in the fact that we grow everything from early double zero maturity all the way to two twos, two threes uh, for what we do with our seed beans. So, you know, we, we started harvesting two weeks ago <laughs> and last week it was rained all week and this week it's been a really good week. We'll, we'll knock out about 400 acres this week of uh, early maturity soybeans. So with that, it gives us a great chance to get a cover seeded if we have beans harvested in early September or mid-September for us, it gives us a nice window to get these covers seeded. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what we do. We're not, not uh, the normal corn, soybeans, till, repeat type, uh, type farm. But. And so what is it that other than you know being with the canning crop and the window that that provided, what was something else that sort of got you down this path to soil health? <laughs> it was the spring of 2012, and I don't know if you have any of those pictures that you pop up on this Facebook thing, but uh, May it was a May day and the wind blew, it was about 60 mile an hour winds, and we had unprotected soil. You know, it's in May, it's early spring. These uh, winter weathered soil aggregates or lumps that are out there and there was just dirt blowing everywhere. Drifts of soil and I had a late planted sweet corn field scheduled to, to be planted and I hadn't done anything and so much dirt moved that I thought 
especially for these late planted sweet corn fields, I got to do something different because I can't just let this topsoil blow around. And this is in May. And so I thought, okay, took me a while to figure out, didn't do anything in, in 2013. 2014, I decided, okay, on these this sweet corn that's gonna be late planted, broadcast some oats, worked it in with the field cultivator, and I got a nice oat cover crop. And, and that was the start of my cover kind of journey. Because <laughs> we're not at the end, we're always learning. Um, and and every, almost everything went wrong with that in, in June. It rained 15 inches in June and I had these oats that were really, really tall. And I got to plant sweet corn in, in uh, two weeks and there's standing water and how am I going to spray these? And it, it, it was a lot of things that went wrong and got them sprayed, planted uh, sweet corn into this oat straw, essentially. <laughs> And I thought this is going to be a mess. And come at the end, they harvested the sweet corn and it yielded the same as all the other sweet corn planted at the same time. I thought, well, if it can go through this, if, if we can have 30 inch tall oat straw, plant sweet corn into that and have it yield the same, I'll try it again. And we managed it a little differently the next year. But then, then we started planting after sweet corn cereal rye and in 2015 we planted beans into the rye and we've just continued to progress and this year was the first year we we no-tilled corn into standing rye yeah. green green into rye so it's progression in and whatnot this next year i'll be we, we strip till a lot of our stuff so after beans we'll strip till going to corn and your no-till beans no-till beans strip till for corn and this was the first year we no-tilled into rye so i'm going to compare after one of these fields i'll plant a cover of rye oats and probably and we'll see when i can get it covered <laughs> uh probably get it seeded this week uh weekend some vetch rye oats i will no-till half of it i'll strip till half of it same fertilizer we ban both nutrients we'll run the same hybrid so the idea is let's see if we see a, a, a tillage effect sure. from that strip. And we'll probably do that on three different fields. So right before we went live, you were kind of telling me about this field behind us. So this was the corn going into the green cover after beans. That was not in the green cover. Oh, okay. Uh, that one was, so it was sweet corn in 2018, had a cereal rye cover after in 2019 and it was wet. It was about four foot tall. And that was the only field I could plant. It was because that rye took up enough moisture. Sure. I could actually plant that one where we couldn't plant anything else. Four foot tall, planted the beans, and uh, then uh, then the corn went into, was strip tilled into the, uh, that rye. There's a lot of straw left when you have four foot tall rye. It was heading out. Head and out, it doesn't break down as fast as two foot tall stem. It's, it's gone through the rapid growth stem elongation. You got a lot of lignin in that stalk or that stem. So higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. So like he was saying, it doesn't break down as easily. That, you know, making strips even after a full year, there was still a lot of straw on the surface. So um, that creates some challenges. It, it you know, it kind of depends on what your goal is. What is your goal? Um, my goal was to scavenge nutrients, have them available for my soybean crop, and by letting it go to four foot tall, that that wasn't achieved because that residue didn't break down quick enough for my soybean crop. Now I'll probably see it in this corn crop, but uh, but the added benefit of letting it go long then is that you've got a residue cover that's going to provide weed control because it doesn't break down as easily but as we as we've learned through this whole series it's like a domino effect of this learning curve so even though we got that you got that added you know weed suppression benefit what happened then <laughs> so it it you know, these were extend beans, and you can talk about whatever chemical uh, programs you want to do on your beans, but these were extend soybeans. 
We're here in Minnesota. We have a June 20th cutoff date. It was a late planting year anyway, because it was wet. So the rye straw, I mean, did a great job of suppressing weeds. It suppressed them past our June 20th cutoff date. For spraying. So now I could not spray dicamba. And they look really clean, and the plan was to come back with um, Flexstar and hit them there. Well, then it rained, and now I got into the second week of July where I run into plant back restrictions with Flexstar for next year's corn. Ended up spraying Cobra, burned my beans, took probably five bushel off that way. So I learned some stuff that. Either I should have terminated it earlier, when it was maybe two feet, mm -hmm. sprayed my dicamba, and and got me by. Um, of course, I can't affect the weather. I can't control that. But it was an observation that the the really tall stuff did delay weed emergence, but with a later planted crop and our June twentieth cutoff date, it took away the dicamba option for me and having to spray having to spray cobra and burn those beans that were probably r1 maybe in r2 i know aborted all those those flowers so last year it cost me some some yield um every year is different this year it would have been great yeah. this year we wouldn't have planted <laughs> beans into four foot tall headed out rye so uh, darn it if we just didn't have that time machine yeah yeah but, <laughs> You know, it, I think what we're going to see is uh, a higher corn yield. We saw it last year where we had a cover in 2018. You know, 2017, we planted beans into it green in 2018. The beans yielded better where we had the rye yeah. versus where we didn't. Same field, same variety. But last year where we had the corn, we had the same regions. This was rye, this is no rye. Same corn hybrid. Where there was rye was 27 bushels better than where there was not rye. We strip tilled it all, fertilized it all the same, same hybrid. So you could see right to the line. And that's something we did back in 2017 with that cover crop. And we're seeing it pay back two years later in our corn. Yeah. And it, it'll be fun to see this year, see if we see that same that same trend of cover in the, you know, 2018, are we going to see it two years later in our corn without doing anything different? So can you tell us a little bit about this field in, in particular? What's going on here? So last year, this field was an early maturity soybean, a, a you know, double zero maturity, uh, harvested in probably mid-September, planted a cereal rye for a, a, a crop here. Uh, our cereal rye... I run a seed cleaning operation. So we harvest it for grain, clean the seed, package it for a, a seed company. So it's all for seed. It's not for say grain for milling and stuff like that. Uh, planted cereal rye here, got it harvested in end of J July. Got this cover planted. It's a bushel of, a bushel of rye, a pound of rapeseed and a pound of radish and half a bushel of oats. Trying to get those three, four different species in there. And uh, why is it important to get all of those different species? Do you think? Well, I don't like to eat just uh, just steak. Well, I do like to eat just steak, <laughs> steak with more steak. Um, I like a variety of, of foods. Uh, our soil microbes and what's what's living down here in my soil livestock like to eat different things. So let's give them all something a little different. Uh, so. The the oats to help with our mycorrhizal fungi, the radishes, the rape, the rye, all have a different a different purpose. So this what we're showing you there. Do you see all those fine little white hairs? So those are actually so what Matt's saying those mycorrhizal fungi. So that's what we're seeing here, and that's what that oat help the oats help to you know form those beneficial relationships. And the reason this is so important. So if you think about these plants forming these relationships with the fungi, especially Watson. this is Watson here. Everyone say hi to Watson. 
He's our assistant today. He's not very tough. <laughs> so those, the fungi, what they do is they, they, they embed themselves into the root and they form and they connect themselves to the neighboring plants. So you end up with this like pipeline that extends the reach of the plant roots into the soil. So then that plant's able to access more nutrients and more resources than it would otherwise by itself. Um, and the important thing about it connecting itself to its neighbor. So it sort of forms like an underground uh, internet that connects everyone together. And research shows that plants actually can communicate with one another through these fungal networks. So that if a plant is attacked by a pest or a pathogen, it'll send out these signals through those fungal pathways and through other sort of chemical responses in the soil, and it'll alert its neighbors. And what the research shows is that the neighbors then send off these other chemical signals and make themselves taste bad to that particular pest. Um, there's some really great resources out there. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Simard, uh, if you Google her, uh, she talks about how trees communicate with one another and the benefits of how most plant communities communicate via these fungal pathways. So it's a little bit of a tangent there. So you've got this diverse mix of covers uh, that ultimately provide mutual benefits um, to your crop. And so once you've got your covers in, what's the next, what's the next step or what's the plan for this field? So this field um, is going to go back to soybeans again next year. Um, the, the brassicas and the oats are going to winter kill. That rye will overwinter and uh, we'll plant green into that. So uh, plant soybeans into that green material next next spring. And then what do you do once you plant green? Do you terminate after that with? So we'll terminate it after we plant. Uh, what we found is typically by planting green into that rye, we don't need to spray a pre-emerge herbicide because, well, we're gonna spray it with Roundup to terminate it, but we're not gonna use a, a soil residual herbicide like a authority or dual or outlook or any of the the others that rye delays those weeds enough that or there, there really probably won't be very many weeds uh because it out competes them early that we don't spend the the 15 17 20 dollars for that that residual herbicide we'll hit it with uh well we'll see if we can spray that can the next year but uh We'll hit it with an early post-emerge and uh, maybe add a residual later to, to get us through for our weed control. So other than saving money on herbicide passes, I know economics is a huge barrier for some folks and it's also a huge sell for others who have implemented soil health. So on your farm, what other economic benefits have you been able to reap using a soil health system? Save passes. Obviously, uh, some of the some of the other things that we've done to help us economically would be, you know, reduce passes across the field. Uh, we we made a pass to seed to cover. That's it. We're gonna we're gonna show up. We're gonna plant. We're gonna spray, which we would normally do whether you worked it or not. So, uh, saving that tillage pass in the spring, a cheaper, quicker pass in the fall to seed this than versus a chisel plow and and whatnot. Uh, I figured it out on a on our strip tailing. So if you let's say you did a thousand acres of strip till versus conventional till, we strip it in the fall. We're covering about 20, 25 acres an hour uh, with a 12 row strip till rig, banding two dry products, variable rating, both of those, doing it all ourselves. Uh, compared to you know just time savings versus a, a conventional tillage. Let's say chisel plow in the fall, field cultivator in the spring. It was about 50 hours difference in time savings. Well, that's either a week that I could do something else, which I probably wouldn't because I, <laughs> I farm, uh, or that's a week, you know, 50 hours that I have to pay somebody yeah. or not pay somebody to do, do to do that job. So look at it that way it's it's 50 hours 50 hours and that's 50 fewer hours on your equipment that's maybe equipment you don't have to own um, we used the field cultivator on one field this year because it was a, a new farm to me that it had been tilled last year uh, that, that was it we haven't pulled our ripper in three years other than to move it out of the shed and put it in a different one but uh, got a nice ripper for sale if you're interested <laughs> uh, so 
just the savings on that, the cost of, you know, it costs you something to, to run that equipment in the spring. We won't have that cost. Um, so, and like I said, from what we've seen, we've seen added yield where we have the covers. Well, and you were able to get into that field. That was the only field you were able. That was the only field we could have planted. And I didn't know how well it was going to work, but uh, it actually worked really well. That that was the first time I'd planted into four foot tall, headed out <laughs> rye in southern Minnesota. Those guys down in Missouri and Illinois, they that's that's old news to them. But <laughs> around here, that was new for me. Um, but we every year we've seen equal or better yields where we have the planted into the cereal rye. This is soybeans. And there hasn't been a single year where they've been less. So if I can make more money because I, I either yield more or I don't spend it on a tillage path, the soil health benefit is the, the gravy on the top. We've got a question I think coming in. What's our question, guys? So the question is planting into cereal rye, what sort of planter setup do you have? So when we started planting green into rye, now we, we've progressed. When we first did this in 2015, we were still a conservation tillage. So it was, you know, a disc ripper left 40, 50, I don't know if they left that much, 30% residue minimum. <laughs> uh, that's what the NRCS uh, or soil and water said it had to. Springfield cultivator passed with points, so we didn't use sweeps, but points, which didn't move till it quite as much. We tilled it. So we had cereal rye, we sprayed it ahead, we tilled it, and it was a big, lumpy, rough seed bed, and we said that's not the way to do it. So the next year we sprayed it, had dead residue, we planted into that, and when we've now we've found that planting into it green works works better. So my planter setup back then was a, a standard white planter, standard down pressure springs, had fixed row cleaners, uh, interlocking tooth ones, and just regular uh, rubber, you know, uh, closing wheels. And that worked fine. You know, we would set the regular springs maybe one notch higher on the down pressure just to make sure we held that row unit in there and we had great success with soybeans that way um, the biggest thing i think that people need to look at is their closing system that i think these planters especially if you have a an airbags or active down pressure system they can stay and keep that seed place it where it needs to be we got to make sure we close that that furrow. Um, since then, and the more no-till and the more minimum tillage we get to, I've added a spike closing wheel, which I think really helps break up that sidewall of that furrow and uh, close that. Soybeans, I, I think, are certainly more forgiving than than corn. Um, I've also now added a single cast closing wheel and a spiked. So that's that's what we run now, and I was really really pleased with how that worked this year. Um, but it's just a regular planter. Uh, it was it was I, I've added Delta Force hydraulic down pressure now, but uh, you know as technology progresses and gets better, you can get these planters that, that can easily no-till and maintain good seed depth. But I would make sure you really look at at closing. So a single cast closing wheel and a spiked on the other side, you know, offset, this year did a really, really nice job. Uh, and the only reason I did that is last year in my 10-year no-till field, it was really hard. And I struggled closing for corn. I struggled closing with the two or with the rubber and the, and the um, spike. So that's why I bought a cast. Casting. So you've also modified your vertical till. Can you talk a little bit about that? So we, when we when we started getting into seeding covers after sweet corn, we tried a few different tools to. Basically, we were looking at cover crop emergence. Uh, we weren't looking at tillage. This is 2014. 
We tried a Salford with the, I don't know what the Salford numbers are. It's the, the wavy coulters are on the spring and they're kind of independent, um, whatever number that is. We tried that. We tried another Salford that was more aggressive, had more concave discs. And then we tried a Sunflower uh, 6631, I think is the number. We had the co-op spread the, the cereal rye and the oats. I think there were radishes too. And we ran these three different tools. And all we were looking at was cover crop emergence. The one sulfur that was the independent wavy coulters it was okay, but there was a lot of rye still on the surface and seed because it doesn't move much soil. It, it moves it sideways, doesn't move much soil. The other sulfur was more aggressive, buried more of it. I think it buried some of it deep. That, that actually had the worst cover crop emergence and the sunflower was the best emergence. Uh, just, it's, it's a slightly concave disc, a, not a, not a eight wave or a 13 wave like the Salfords, a serrated blade, moves a little dirt sideways, not nearly as much as the other one. We only run that about an inch to an inch and a half deep. And, and that's what this all got seeded with. So what we did is we, oh, lost my mic. <laughs> we ended up uh, mounting a Valmar air seeder. Well, we have it on a trailer, but we pull it behind that. So it uh, broadcasts the seed right over the back set of discs. And then the rolling basket helps incorporate that. And that's what we seeded this with. We really like that. It holds. Uh, I think 60 bushels they say, but we can we can put a lot of seed in that versus a drill that only holds so much. What we've noticed is mixes, it doesn't really settle and separate much because it's running on pretty good sized tires that it doesn't bounce right on the ground like a drill does. It's it's smooth. So with with lots of mixes, we don't see a lot of separation in seed, which I don't know, it's quick. We can pull it at eight and a half miles an hour. You don't have to, you know, we can do 50 acres depends on what your mix is 50 to 80 acres on a fill and you just go so um, that's what we do it's is a tillage yes it's it's a little tillage but it's it's shallow tillage uh, and it's a good way to get roots growing and that's what we do so i also know matt that you're a mentor farmer with the minnesota soil coalition and I know in, in this part of the state, in every part of the state, there's challenges and barriers to folks implementing these practices. So what are some of the resources that you found most useful to you when you were sort of in that, you know, we all in this learning curve, but in that transitioning part, I know having mentors, having other farmers to talk to is really important. So when I started thinking about, uh, going down this path, or, or really it was about the strip tail. I, I thought I wanted a strip tail because it made sense to me economically in my head that let's cut back passes, it's more time for other things, It's that makes sense. So I, I, I started going to some field days and talking with farmers that were doing it. And they were up in the Red River Valley and I thought if they can strip till there, I can strip till here. And it was really, talking to those farmers that that were doing this that boy I could bounce ideas off of them and there's a guy north of us here about oh 20 miles that strip tails and I got his number and I, I just talked to him and I said what are you doing and, and finding out what some of the challenges they went through it, it made it for me that okay I don't have to do it because they've said that that that, that was a failure um, you know don't set yourself up for failure. People talk about cover cropping and I'm gonna put it on this field. Well, that field may not have any, and then they have bad results. Yep. If it's a bad field, it's a bad field whether you have cover crops <laughs> or not. Uh, don't blame it on the cover crops. If, you know, if it's a sandy piece of ground and it's a dry year, it's not the cover crops fault. You're adding an extra challenge into that. Yeah. Don't set yourself up for failure. Yeah. And that's what I've told people too is try it on a field that has some potential. Don't put it on a dud that is going to fail anyway, or, or has the opportunity to. So, uh, 
but for me, just talking to the people that have, have done it before really gave me the confidence that, hey, I got somebody I can lean on. I can try this. They've done it. I can do it. I can make it work. So just having somebody to talk to was, was really important. So I know you said you're not you're not the normal farmer <laughs> in this in this part of the, the state here, but have you noticed that by you sort of experimenting and you're pretty high visibility here. I mean you're not far out of Redwood Falls. Have you noticed uh, are you getting phone calls or are you starting to see maybe your neighbors trying things they otherwise wouldn't? You know, uh, I've I've had people call. I I sell some of this cereal rice seed myself too. So if people have called about that. I just had a good conversation with a guy a couple of days ago. He had called. He has he he grows these seed beans too for for this seed company. So he has some early beans off. It's a it's a tough farm. He said that too. It's high pH in half of it, sandy on the other half, and it just wasn't a good field, but he's, he knows he needs to do something different. It's going to corn next year. He wondered about planting rye. He goes to our church with me too. Planting rye this year. And we had a real good conversation. Him going to corn. And what I know now is tilling, tilling your rye in the spring is not a good idea. They're set up for tillage with his planter going to corn, I, I really suggested going with something like oats, something that will winter kill. Oats, rapeseed, you know, it's, it's relatively cheap. You're gonna get some good cover. The brassicas can handle cold temps, so it's, you can still handle it. As much as I'd like to sell your rye, Dan, I don't know that in your situation, planting rye going to corn is your first, gonna be your first, step in covers. Uh, so there's more and more people asking questions. Um, I've got a field down here right along Highway 71. It's fenced in. It was cereal rye. We've got this cover. I've got a guy that's going to graze it uh, this year. There's a nice big bright soil health sign uh, right there that you can see. And I think just, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but as people drive by Highway 71, drive by that field, it, it maybe brings, catches their attention and, oh, there is something different out here. There's there's a green field and maybe when he gets uh, cattle out there, I'll have another sign that says, covers plus cows equals cents. <laughs> you know, you know. The, the, the sense. Sense. <laughs> um, because it is, I mean, financially, it's a benefit for him. Right. I think it's a good deal for me. They're not my cows, but I think having animals on the land is, is gonna benefit me as well. So it, it's a win-win for, for both of us. So uh, there's, there's more people asking questions. I've, I've run into people at the co-op that have just, you know, what are you doing out there? And you don't have to wanna do it, but if you're willing to ask and you're willing to, or you're, you're thinking about it, there's, the, the wheels are turning for a lot of people and I do, it, it hasn't cost me money. It, it has not cost me money that I say it, it doesn't work because it, it's been break even or, or financially better every single time. So why not do it? If it's, if it's not negatively affecting me financially, why wouldn't I do it? And I have, the, I have the opportunity to do it with early season crops. Uh, I flew on some stuff on some corn over there along 71, and we'll run our sunflower, our vertical tillage tool over a lot of our corn acres. And depending on how late it is, I'll seed rye with it then too. So I'm gonna kind of compare flying on versus the VT. And I think the VT incorporated seed will, will be better. But uh, so you were also talking about, you know, you've got a lot of experience growing a lot of different varieties of beans. And so you were talking Gosh. about having an earlier season, like your early one bean, and talk a little bit about the benefits of having that, the opportunities it provides, and also what you've noticed with yield on those. So a little we'll back up talk history. Here in Redwood, we have three branches of, uh, well, I'll just say it, Bear now. It was Monsanto. 
there's the research, there's the parent seed or pre-commercial, which is the in-between, and then we have a production site. So we have kind of all three phases of soybean production. So research handles 2,000, 3,000 new soybean varieties. They call out a bunch. They send them to the parent seed or the pre-foundation, which is who we grow for. And that is to replicate the seed, to build up quantities that now they can go to the production model where farmers will end up buying that seed. So it, we've done that from since 2003. And we grow everything from double zeros to, now they've cut us back to the, like the two threes, two fours, we used to grow up to two sevens. Two sevens in Southern Minnesota is a little far out. Uh, but, so in all of those years, we get to harvest all of these different maturities. And what I've noticed is, especially in the last five years, I'm seeing some of the best yields in our early maturity beans or at least equal. So we're into 1.0 you know, maturity stuff now, and we're seeing in the low 60s in, in Redwood County, low 60s for a 1.0 is, is really pretty good. And here we are, September 18th, harvesting 1.0 beans, and they're yielding in the low 60s. I can get a cover seeded. So, and I don't know if it's been by, by a choice at the, the breeders or what, if they're really trying to catch up those early beans, but that's what I have noticed is our early beans are, are catching up to our full season beans. So I think when you talk about cover crops and you talk about you know, traditional farming, corn, soybean rotation, you can get a bean now that's gonna yield pretty well in that early maturity that you can get off and you can get a cover established. Um, if you're a livestock guy and you planted rye after your beans that came back in the spring and you harvested some feed in you know, early May and then you planted corn into that, that's a win-win. Um, you get some feed, you plant your corn, you covered your soil. Uh, so it's just been an observation. I don't know if, if that's your plan or not, but <laughs> just my observation. Well, I know that that's, we have another question coming in from Facebook. So on the soybean side of things, have you seen a change in perhaps especially the cover crop being used So the question is, on the soybean end of things, have you noticed a change in things from the pest perspective? Aphids, that, that kind of stuff? Yes, actually, especially aphids. Um, Notice that two years ago. We haven't had a lot of aphid pressure this year or last year. Probably shouldn't talk about it. Next year will be terrible. But, <laughs> Knock uh, on wood. <laughs> uh, we didn't have much for aphids this year or last year. 2018, we saw a real direct correlation where we planted beans into the green rye. We did not have as many aphids, and we actually didn't have to spray those compared to the the same variety of beans where we didn't have it. I don't know what it was, if it was a delayed, um, you know, I don't really know what it was, uh, if they were just a little behind, but that was a, a very good, uh, it was, I mean, it was right there. Aphids, not, oh, aphids. As, not as many aphids. So I didn't have, you know, we just didn't have many aphids last year to really see. Um, last year where we had, planted beans into the rye and not into the rye, there was multiple different varieties there. So it, you know, it's, it's tough to tell. We've seen varietal differences too in the soybeans that, you know, we may have 30 different soybean varieties in a 50 acre field like I had over here. And you walk across the field and this one has aphids and you go five feet into the next one and there's no aphids. So, but that two years ago, we did see a definite where we planted beans into green rye had fewer aphids that we did not have to spray those, but we sprayed those. So maybe it was that year, maybe it was that variety, but that was a definite observation. Well, I mean, we've talked about all of these benefits. You've talked about how you've really minimized your erosion with your covers, how you've really minimized pest how you've noticed that you're able to get into your fields sooner. What other observations over the years have you noticed as far as the benefits to your soil? I mean, you've got some of the darkest 
as a soil scientist, we don't even have a color chip uh, as dark as, as <laughs> Matt's soil is here. Now, I'm not going to take all the credit for that because <laughs> this was created from Mother Nature. Mother yeah, Nature. but you've done a good job. Uh, of we happen it. to be in a, a wonderful place that has great, dark, deep topsoils. Uh, I'm trying to keep it. And I, that's that's my goal is let's keep that as productive as we can. Uh, one other thing that that I think is really important that I think the covers do is, you know, there's such a small percentage of our population that are actively farming, and that's a very large percentage that are not. And that large percentage, they're voting, they're they're making regulations, they're passing laws that directly affect us. Yeah. And when they drive by and they see a bare field and they see the wind blowing dirt and they see dirty snow in the winter here, they notice that as they're driving yeah. down the highway. So I think when we talk about other benefits, it's a public perception thing. When they can drive down Highway 71, or any of these roads and they see somebody doing something to protect soil, to help our environment, I'm hoping that that's gonna go a long ways towards people maybe realizing that you know, farmers are, are actually doing something good. They're, yeah. they're not wrecking the environment, uh, which I know they don't all think that, but I think it, it's good for public perception. And again, if it's not hurting me negatively financially, it, it, it's not going to hurt with that. So yeah. if, if we can make sure that hey, we're doing what, what's good for the environment, we're, we're covering our soil, we're, we're uh, you know, just being good stewards, I think that's an important part of it too. Yeah, and it reflects on all of agriculture. It does, because somebody's always watching. Yeah. You don't see them, but they're forming opinions as they drive down the road and what they're seeing. So. Um, do you think, I, I think you're absolutely right about, oh, sorry, we do have another question coming in. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So the question is on economics, whose numbers are you using? Your numbers, Iowa numbers, how do you pencil it out? So when I've looked at strip till versus conventional till, I use my numbers, because I had my numbers. Uh, you know, if you talk about, if, if you're pitching this to, if you're a farmer and you're a farmer and you're a farmer, your numbers are gonna be different than mine. And that's where I kind of use the Iowa State numbers just because it's a set number that this, but for like the strip till cost comparison and, and we're not gonna get in all of my financials. I'm not afraid of sharing them because it is beneficial for me to strip till and what we're doing with my own numbers. Um, the no-till, obviously, if, if it's all no-till, I have a hard time comparing, but uh, for the strip-till and stuff, that, that was all my numbers that I know that is financially better than the, the program we were doing before. When we talk about, uh, and I've got a PowerPoint that shows some of this too, the soybeans into that, herbicide costs and stuff, those were what we were paying. So if we're cutting out that was generic dual that year that we cut out. That was like 1250 an acre or something. Uh, it, it offset it with $5 an acre roundup for 476, I think is what we paid that year. So those herbicide, those are our numbers. You start going with tillage expense and stuff. I think it's sometimes better to use a Iowa State number just because sure. it's somewhat widely accepted. Uh, everybody's costs are different. But how often, and this is a great point that you brought up earlier, how often do you put a value on your time? I, I mean, value my time a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of stuff going on. And there's an opportunity cost to your time because what else could you be doing with your time? Could you be working another job? Could you be spending it with your family? What is your, there's an opportunity cost to that. Just like your money's sitting in a bank doing nothing, invest it. What, are you, what else are you going to do? Uh, there's an opportunity. So I value my time a lot. If that's 50 hours that I 
would have been doing spring tillage or slower fall tillage or whatever you want to say, what could I have been doing with those 50 hours? Could I have been goose hunting in Saskatchewan? Could I have been deer hunting? What could I have been playing with my girls? You know. Well, and that gets to this bigger question of quality of life. Like under a soil health management system, based on what you were prior to 2014, do you think your quality of life has improved? I think so. Um, I'm a learner. I like to do different things. So this is fun to me. This is trying something new. I enjoy it more than till, plant, harvest, till, you know, just repeat. This is, this is more fun to me. Uh, I enjoy different things. I don't worry so much. Like last year, we were harvesting on frozen ground. It, it froze up. People weren't getting their tillage done. They're worried. Oh, geez, I can't get it ripped. We don't worry about it. We just <laughs> parked the sunflower in the shed and just kept combining corn. We'll just no-till it. And, and we were comfortable with that. And it didn't bother us. We had a thaw. It kind of thawed out the third week of November. And people were getting their rippers out. And they're pulling it through the mud. And we pulled out the tile plow. And we, we put plastic in the ground. And that was way better time spent, I thought, than, than doing tillage in the mud. So. Um, it was a lot less stress yeah. and not having to have somebody get out and get fields worked in the spring. We just show up and plant in the strips or just no-till beans. There's a lot less stress and we can get a lot more acres covered um, by doing that. We've got two planters because a lot of times we're planting corn and, and I plant those beans for bear kind of at the same time. So. We have two planters and dad can, he can go plant corn and I can plant beans and you know, it, it works out pretty well. So you farm with you, your grandfather, which is amazing to me that he's in his nineties and he's still helping. You've got your dad, you've got you, you've got your girls. And I know Matt, you are just one of the most impassioned speakers for soil health. And I know that this idea of legacy is so important to you. So is that, I mean, that's got to be something that really is in your mind. It, it drives you with this idea of keeping going with soil health. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that obviously I'm very fortunate in the fact that I don't have the previous generations telling me that's not going to work. That's not going to work. It won't work. Not doing it, it's not going to work because that's what I hear a lot from younger people that are wanting to try this is oh, I want to do this but but dad or grandpa or my uncle he doesn't want to do it so we're not doing it I haven't had that and and I mentioned that to my grandma uh, that you know we call him whitey because he has white hair <laughs> uh, my grandpa whitey uh you know you, whitey's He's, he's open to change. He's willing to change. And she kind of found that humorous because uh, she doesn't see him willing to change. But in the farming world, he was willing to do different things. He grew, he grew seed corn when that was here in town. They grew sunflowers one year. They, they had sunflowers at a, in town. Always done canning crops. Has always tried different things. Pass that mindset on to my father. And, and I'm just following suit. So this isn't anything that I just came up with. This has been passed on from them that you don't always have to do everything like everybody else. Be willing to try things. And, and I'm really blessed that I didn't have somebody telling me, you can't do that. Um, you know, the strip tail was my idea. Dad said, uh, you do it. I'll see how it goes. We'll try. I'll try a little. That was the first year. By July of that first year, he was sold. We're going to strip till. So, um, but but making sure that I carry on, you know, do the best I can for for the next person. It may not be my girls. I, I don't know. But they did that for me. I need to do my part. It's important that you know water's going to fall on this land. We talk about. Uh, nutrient runoff we talk about doing our part it's not just my water it's going to leave this land too because we spend money on tile and water leaves here so i want to make sure that 
when when stuff leaves this land, it's in the best best condition it can be in too. Watch out for those radishes. Watch. Right, Watts. <laughs> uh, but uh, do we have another question, Holly? So the question is, have you noticed a change in your tile rates or the infiltration heading into your tile because you've you know, invested in building your soil structure? Can you talk a little bit about what you've kind of observed with that? Good question on infiltration. And I think that's our biggest gain from the, the soil health has been our, our water, water infiltration. And I don't know, I can't speak so much to in, increased tile flow and in, you know, rates because I'm not monitoring. What I can say is our land can hold a lot more water. Our soil can hold a lot more water where we've had the cover crops and minimize tillage. And our biggest yield increases have been on the hills. And that was even in 2018. It was, so we use climate field view uh, kind of because we have to because we're a seed grower, but I, I find it usable and I find some value to it. So in 2018 where we had the cover crop and versus where we didn't, same soybean hybrid or variety, um, our biggest yield difference was on the hill and it rained and it rained and it rained in 2018. <laughs> so it was not a shortage of moisture, no. <laughs> but up here on the hill versus up here on the hill, Cover crop, no cover crop, it was a 13 bushel difference here. Why is that? And I really think that water soaked in up on the hill instead of running off to the bottom. And we saw that again last year in that same field with the corn. That's where our highest yield increase was, or yield difference was. I've got a field that's been no-till, this is the third year. And 2018, we had 10 and a half inches of rain in June or July. It was July 3rd. Lots of drought notes. Uh, this was after one of the four inch rains walked out there. I actually drove my ranger out there. Didn't sink in anywhere. Pond right here. Tile that goes through it. One tile goes into the neighbors. Same, same tile. He's full with tillage. This has been no till third year. This is on a Wednesday. I I can walk everywhere, water squishes out from underneath my shoes, it's saturated, but I'd move my boot and that water would go right back into the soil. And that was on a Wednesday and I thought, that's pretty neat. Came back on Thursday to show my dad that how cool this is and the water's gone. There's, there's one 10 inch county tile that goes through that, goes through mine right into his. We're 30 feet side of the fence. On Thursday, I don't have any water. He still has a pond. So when you talk about roots and infiltration and that, absolutely, the covers and the stuff has really helped our water holding capacity and our infiltration rate. So now let's progress even farther. If we're going to continue on this wet pattern that we've had the last few years, if I can have my soil hold water and have a pond on one day and have a no pond the next day with only one tile, that can help me on a wet year. And if I can hold more water up on the hill because it can soak in the soil, that's less water to go to my low spot to drown out my crop. So now if you have, I guess I have, my phone on <laughs> 30,000 feet of tile in an 80 and it's pattern tiled if we can get it there to the tile it makes sense to me that if we have a, a soil that it, it just runs off and it all runs down to here now it all has to go into a small area of tile versus if we can have it infiltrate into the whole field and we have tile under the whole field we can get rid of our water quicker well and you you said 10 inches of rain and that's I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible amount of water. Yeah, it was and, way too much water. Right, but it's, <laughs> At not, one time. it's not, unfortunately not uncommon. I mean, how many of these, you know, greater than four or five inch rains have you seen in the last 10 years? Too many. Too many. Uh, and we've been real fortunate here this year. 
you don't have to go very far northeast of here and they had at least two six inches this year some areas had that eight nine ten i don't know uh, 14. <laughs> i mean it, it's just it doesn't matter how much tile you have you're you're gonna have lost crop and runoff and stuff when you have 14 inches of rain in one event and the only way to you know maximize or to make the most of a situation like that is to make sure you've built the soil that can withstand the onslaught of water that is let's be honest probably not going away anytime soon yeah and the other thing with those those no-tilled fields and like i said it's only a third year and i thought that was pretty amazing that it's changed that quickly but uh it carries a load so much better yeah that we we didn't make any ruts i mean harvesting that stuff even in 2018 where it was really wet you could drive through there and the tires are wet you'd see them roll up they're wet there's no ruts and there's no soil on those tires no not <laughs> in, in and we had come from another field that was in our previous system and we couldn't pull the the truck in there and we had to cart it all and dump it on the road you know you know cart it all and you know, harvesting corn we went to that that was actually only the second year in that was the third year in no-till on that field and we pulled the semi in the field you could i mean it was a huge difference in only yeah. the third year holly we have another question So what was the hardest part during the transition from conventional to soil health for you guys? That's a big question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to break down my answer between <laughs> strip till and no till. Sure. Uh, I would not have started no tailing if I kind of wouldn't have been forced to. Um, I, I gained some ground. They were tied to a three year equip contract sure. for no till. My first year was the third year of that contract, and they didn't want to pay back. You know, it was probably 300 acres. They did not want to pay back, so they asked me to no-till it. And I had just gotten a new planter with the Delta Force and, and whatnot. I thought, okay, I think this will work. It'll be a good test. The biggest issue for no-tilling corn is nutrient placement, is, is fertilizing. Nitrogen's easy, you know, a mobile nutrient, that's easy. We can, we can, there's all sorts of ways to do that. My non-mobile nutrients, my P, my K, all of that, how am I gonna place that where the corn's gonna get it? You know, broadcasting it on the surface is not a, a great way to fertilize a corn crop. Because I, I don't know, you're a soil scientist. Corn roots don't grow on the surface. No. So. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Let's get that fertilizer in the soil. So, you know, my, my, my fertilizer system for my, my strip till, uh, it's, a, it's a twin bin cart with a three point on the back. So I made a bar that has single disc openers and I banned, so for my, my no-till corn, I banned my, my P and K. I wish I'd go deeper, but about three, three to three and a half inches deep. And then I do that in the fall, and then I plant my corn right on that band in the spring. That, I think, is one of the biggest challenges in no-till is, especially corn, how do we fertilize this crop? And it, it took me that first year, that didn't work. The second year, it, I, was, I had it ready. I was going to run it in the spring. But 2019, it was wet and it was late. And by yeah. the time it was dry enough to do that, I'd better be planting. So this this uh, year will be the first year I'll see the results of banding those nutrients. Um, the strips, sorry. The strips, I think the biggest challenge that first year was just getting stuff laid out. Um, you're making strips where you're gonna plant. So you have to think about planting while you're making the strips um, and adjusting the equipment. You know, that was 20, 2018 was the first year we strip tilled everything and it, it was wet and we had lots of lumps. It, it wasn't the ideal year to be making strips and then it froze up and 
that didn't work either. But uh, just thinking ahead and laying out the field, and we had most of our RTK lines all set up, but kind of planning ahead, and, and that was a challenge that first year of just, okay, getting it all laid out and thinking ahead, and we were doing 36 end rows uh, last year, and, and that, that works all right, but you end up either having to deadhead around, so we ended up going 48 end rows. That made turning easier and stuff too. So just some of those logistics was a challenge that first year um, of just laying out fields and actually doing the, the strip, making the strips. So other than having some folks that you could call and talk to, what were some, and you've mentioned going to field days, what are some other sort of key resources that were really helpful to you, especially in those early years? For the strip tailing, I've got a really good relationship with our co-op. Uh, we, we haven't been price hopping and going here and going here and going there. That played a real important role come strip tailing time for fertilizer delivery. So I have a fertilizer tender. It's nothing pretty. It was cheap, but it works and I don't drive it anywhere. I drive it from my yard to the field my co-op will tend it right to my tender. That was huge because that's one less person I have to find to run fertilizer. Uh, I can get by with a real nice fertilizer tender. Uh, I wouldn't take it down the road real far. It's not terrible, but uh, it's not roadworthy to be hauling fertilizer all fall. So that was, I could buy something cheaper and I haven't had to wait for fertilizer at all. They they like it because they I just say, hey, I want you know nine thousand of the blend and I want uh, six thousand potash, and they put it in the tender. So that has been really helpful. Um, and really, is the support of you know, obviously the people I farm with, my dad, who. He, he relies on me making sure I have good strips and good nutrient placement and stuff. So he, he's trusting me. Uh, work with a, a consulting firm that, that makes all of our blends and our maps and all of that stuff and does that. They've been really great uh, to work with. So uh, you mentioned the people to bounce ideas off of. And there's kind of a bunch of people we'll, I'll talk to and how, how's the strips going? The guy down by you know, Wells that runs the, runs the same uh, units as I do, and the guy up north has the same units. And he grew some rye up there too, so I talked with him about how was your rye, and just that network of just bouncing ideas off of each other and what worked, what didn't work, what are you doing different next year? And they're all they're all trying different things, so yeah. it's fun. I can't believe it's been an hour already, Matt. We could. I wish we could talk all day, um, but I really, I know, you've got soybeans to harvest, gosh darn it. Well, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your harvest and on a beautiful day like this to get work done to come and talk to us. I can't think of a better way to finish our Friday on the Farm series than with Matt Tiffany. So I appreciate it so much, Matt. Thanks, thanks for being here and for sharing all of your knowledge. Uh, it's just, it's been great. Uh, thanks for coming out again. It's fun. Um, I don't know everything, but I'm learning and we're trying and uh, can tell you what I won't do again. So. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so much, Matt. We really appreciate it. And thank all of you for your great questions and for joining us on this series. And uh, make sure to check out all of the recordings if you missed any of these on the Minnesota Soul Health Coalition YouTube channel. Thanks again. Have a great, uh, enjoy the day, everybody. All right, that concludes our final session of Fridays on the Farm. Thank you, Matt and Kristen, and thank you to all the others who made this series possible, including our partners, the UMN Extension, the Minnesota NRCS, North Central Region of SARE, and the Renville and Redwood Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And on behalf of the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon.